Okay, moving on here with a couple Lewis structures. And uh, let me just go maybe slightly out of order here in terms of um, the way I've laid these out. And let's, let's go to O2 next. Now, the first, um, the first point in our writing Lewis structures procedure says draw the skeletal structure of the compound. I think it's worth pointing out one and two you can do in either order. So you could count the number of electrons first, then draw the structure. That won't make a difference in terms of those two. But you do have to do one and two before you start to think about the later steps, three and four. Um, but since this is a diatomic molecule, the structure is pretty much trivial. We're just going to connect them with a bond. Right, so two, again, two shared electrons between the atoms. Um, oxygen, the column it's in in the periodic table, each oxygen is going to have six valence electrons. So two times six, there are a total of 12 electrons. Right, so that's the first two rules. Now the third rule says complete the octets of the surrounding atoms. We don't really have surrounding atoms here because there's only two, but we're going to complete the octets there with the remaining electrons. So again, we use two to make a bond here. That means we have 10 left over. Now, I said that we refer to these electrons that aren't bonding as lone pairs usually. Um, so the best policy as you're adding them in is to keep them in pairs. Right? They're, they're, if there's a rare case where you have an odd number of electrons, you will have a single electron that's by itself. Those are generally pretty unstable molecules, right? It is a structural thing we should think about. How does, what does the bonding look like in a molecule like that? But for this type of structure, keep the electrons paired. That's going to be a helpful thing to get to the right structure at the end. So if I just start on one side, and it doesn't matter which side, and I complete the octet, there's already two electrons there from the bond, so I add six more. That gets me to eight for that oxygen. So that oxygen has at least satisfied the octet rule. Now two and then six, I used eight, there's four electrons left. I can put those in pairs on the other oxygen. Right Now the last step says after completing steps one through three, central atom has fewer than eight electrons, try adding double or triple bonds. Now we don't really have a central atom in a diatomic molecule, but the, that wording still applies. We want, need to add more bonds here to try to make sure, remember we're trying to satisfy the octet rule, we want both oxygens to have eight electrons. Well, the one on the left here has eight, the one on the right only has six. What we could do here is share. So if I take a pair of electrons that is just associated with one oxygen, but I share them so that they're contributing to both oxygens, I would get a second bond. So there would be two sets of bonding electrons, right? Or a double bond between the oxygen atoms. And then each oxygen still has four electrons on it, okay? Now, count up the total for each oxygen, two, four, six, eight for the one on the left, two, four, six, eight for the one on the right. We've satisfied the octet rule, right? Now, generally, we satisfy the octet rule, right? And we're gonna see some other rules like formal charge that we'll wanna to try to satisfy as well. That means we've drawn a structure that is a good representation of the bonding that is occurring in that molecule. So based on this structure, we would be able to say that, well, the oxygen is held together by a double bond, right? And you may imagine that's a little different than the bonding we had up here in the chlorine, which is held together by a single bond, right? So double bonds tend to be shorter than single bonds and they tend to be stronger than single bonds, okay? Now, if we come over to nitrogen, right, and there's a reason why I put oxygen first, um, we get something pretty similar, right? Again, it's a diatomic molecule. So starting the structure, we just connect the atoms, right? And that uses up two electrons. Um, but where nitrogen is in the periodic table, it's only got five valence electrons per atom. So five times two, because there's two nitrogen atoms. In this case, we've got a total of 10 electrons. We already used two, right? Because we made a bond in the skeleton. That means we have eight left. We want to go to satisfy the octet rule, right? We could do something like this, right? Just start on the left, give that nitrogen enough to satisfy the octet rule which would be six. That would get it to eight. Two, four, six, eight. We used up eight electrons. Out of 10, there's only two left. Those two could go on this nitrogen, right? But now I don't have, I, you know, now we want to check for the octet rule. We haven't satisfied the octet rule, particularly for this one on the right. The one on the left has eight. The one on the right only has 
four. It's got the bond and it's got one pair of non-bonding electrons. So if I share, that helps, right? That would give me a structure like this with two bonds. But that still doesn't get me all the way to the octet rule. I still have eight on the nitrogen on the left side here, but I've only come up to six on the right. Two, four from the bonds, and then the two non-bonding brings us up to six. So just sharing one pair doesn't work. I've got to share another pair from that nitrogen that's on the left. Now, if I do that, I end up with three pairs of electrons contributing to the bonding, or what we would call a triple bond. Right? Triple bond is longer, or sorry, is shorter than a double bond. Double bond is shorter than a single bond. Triple bond is stronger than a double bond. Double bond is stronger than a single bond. So the nitrogen molecule and it has a triple bond between the nitrogen atoms. And we arrive at that right by following these rules for trying to get to the right structure, right? trying to get to the octet here for the nitrogens. Now, a question that will often come up here for N2, right? I broke these up and I put six on one side and two on the other. Right? Now, some people are seriously bothered to their soul by that because they want everything to be symmetrical. Right? Now, there are cases where molecules will end up symmetrical. There are cases where they won't. Right? So there may be a point where you have to get over that. But this is not one of those points, right? If you said, well, there I used two electrons, that means I have eight left, I'm gonna put four on each, that will still get you to the right answer. So don't get overly concerned about um, problems here because this is a pretty robust set of steps designed so there aren't problems like this. If you were here, you would add a pair from both sides, right? Starting with the uh, structure, each one has six electrons, so we have to share from each side. But you would end up at exactly the same final picture, the triple bond between the nitrogens. So if you like things to be symmetrical a little more, you can do it that way. If you want to count up to the octet on one and then move to the next, that works as well. Okay, now let's move down here to CO2. Um, so a couple more issues are going to pop up here with CO2. So we can at least start the conversation, um, but we may have to move to another video before we finish the conversation about CO2. Um, the first thing that's going to be problematic here is there are three atoms now. So, so far we've only done diatomic molecules. Right? Drawing a skeleton um, that describes the structure of a diatomic molecule is I think trivial is a good way to describe it because if you just have two points, you draw a line between them, that's your structure. Um, in this case, we've got three atoms involved here in the structure, and that means one is going to be in the middle. Um, and in fact, with CO2, we really would have two possibilities here. I'm going to put them over to the left a little bit because I want to save the space for, for when we decide to actually draw. Because there's carbons and oxygens here, you could have the carbon be the atom in the middle, or you could have one of the oxygens be the atom in the middle in the structure. So now, with three atoms, we need to distinguish between these two possibilities. So if you look on your writing Lewis structures handout, the first rule right, to draw the skeletal structure of the compound, draw a single bond between the central atom and each of the surrounding atoms. Right? We did that for both of those cases. But then it says, for multi-atom molecules, place the least electronegative element in the center of the structure, right? So which one is less electronegative, carbon or oxygen? We're going to have to talk about electronegativity to figure that out. So I'm going to hop back over to the first page of the lecture notes. I've got a little um, section on electronegativity here. And let me just mention the definition of electronegativity is a tendency for an atom to pull electrons towards itself in a bond. Okay, so more electron, uh, more electronegative atoms will tend to pull the shared electrons toward themselves away from the other element, right? and the less electronegative element will kind of lose some of the electrons associated with it. So. This is often referred to as sort of a selfishness. The, the more electronegative element is selfish about sharing its electrons. The less electronegative element is a little more open 
um, to sharing electrons. Um, now, electronegativity is a periodic property, so there's a way to think about it in terms of the periodic table. Right? So an element is likely to kind of hold its electrons close if it has high nuclear charge, right? And we know nuclear charge goes up as we're going across a row, so it's going up relative to the shell we're filling. So electronegativity increases as we go across the periodic table. And as um, we add more layers of electrons, more shells, right, the electrons on the outside, the valence electrons, um, will experience less and less pull in terms of the uh, nuclear charge starting to be shielded. So as we go down the periodic table, electronegativity is going to decrease. Right, so it, it goes up as you go to the right, right, and we could say it goes up as you go up the periodic table. So electronegativity is going to be the highest over here, right, which would be where fluorine is, right? The, the noble gases would have high electronegativities as well, but since they don't make bonds, this is really a uh, definition is only for bonded compounds. It's going to be highest up there. It's going to be lowest up around the other corner. Francium is the lowest electronegativity, and fluorine is the highest. Now, the periodic table that we use in class actually has values for electronegativity. So right underneath the atomic mass, there is a numerical value for electronegativity. Most electronegativity scales run up to four. Fluorine is four, right? And we can see oxygen's 3.5, nitrogen's three, carbon's 2.5. It's dropping as we go this way to the left, right? And if we start at fluorine four, chlorine's three, bromine's 2.8, iodine's 2.5. It's dropping as we go down as well. So you should be aware of the trend and the periodic table, but you'll have this periodic table when you're taking an exam. You just need to remember, right? And it even tells you here in the key, right? This is the electronegativity value here at the bottom. You can find it here on the page. Now, what we see here, carbon's 2.5, oxygen is 3.5. Carbon is less electronegative. That means it's better at sharing. That means it is a better atom to put in the center of a molecule. So back over here for CO2, the correct skeletal structure will be the one with carbon in the middle because of the electronegativity. Now, if you've had drawing before in your high school class or some other class, right, this is an issue that often gets simplified. Um, a lot of times um, a procedure will say, put the biggest element in the middle. And that generally trends with electronegativity, but not all the time. So it's more complicated than the biggest atom. Um, some uh, lists will say put the unique atom in the middle and that again that generally works the way molecules are built the unique atom is usually the less electronegative but that doesn't work all the time the one that is the most consistent is the electronegativity so that would be the best way to decide what goes in the middle uh, video is getting a little long so we'll have to pause here on co2 and come back to co2 in the next video